Section three of Builders of United Italy by Rupert S. Holland. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two Manzoni, the Man of Letters. The position of Manzoni in modern Italian life and literature is doubly interesting, both because his work in poetry and the drama marks the vital turning point in the historic battle of classicism with romanticism, and because his romance, I Promessi Sposi, is the greatest achievement in all Italian letters in the field of the novel. Walter Scott gave the country north of Tweed a history in the Waverley novels, and Alessandro Manzoni's writing a little later, at a time when Scott's work was a great factor in European literature, gave Italy a history in the same sense. The inestimable service that the Waverley novels did Scotland, I Promessi Sposi did the disrupted states of Italy. The spirit of the French Revolution was all-engrossing, as subversive of the old religions philosophies and literatures as it was of the old politics it represented the actual thoughts of the men of that era but it developed so rapidly and fell into such excesses that its downfall was sudden and complete then the reaction set in which as de sanctis in his history of the movement says was as rapid and violent as the revolution the white terror succeeded to the red the same critic goes on to show that there were at this period two great philosophic principles materialism and scepticism and that in opposition to them there rose a spirituality which was carried to the heights of idealism this spirituality approached the mysticism of medieval days to the right of nature he says was opposed the divine right to popular sovereignty legitimacy to individual rights the state to liberty authority and order the middle ages returned in triumph christianity hitherto the target of all offence became the centre of every philosophical investigation the banner of all social and religious progress the criterions of art were changed there was a pagan art and a christian art where highest expression was sought in the gothic in the glooms in the mysteries the vague the indefinite in a beyond which was called the ideal in an inspiration towards the infinite incapable of fruition and therefore melancholy to voltaire and rousseau succeeded chateaubriand de stal lamartine victor hugo lamenet and in eighteen fifteen appeared the sacred hymns of the young manzoni this spirit of idealism became the incentive for the new school of romance in literature and the drama in contrast to the drab materialism of the revolutionary age this school of romance is not however to be considered as diametrically opposed to the classical school for they had much in common and the contrast between them lay not so much in the spirit which animated them as in the strict regard of classicism for the time-hallowed unities of time place and action and the willingness of the romantic school to sacrifice all these for freedom of movement and effect the new school wished to find its poems in the experiences of men of that day to write its dramas about any comedy or tragedy without regard to their classic form it wished freedom to grow as its own spirit might dictate in germany and england great romanticists were ripening into power goethe and berger scott and byron were being widely read in italy and the dramas of both schiller and shakespeare were continually translated and reproduced in italian verse the restoration of the austrians and bourbons after the napoleonic downfall made any chance to speak political truths impossible even in the half-veiled militant form used earlier by alfieri the romantic school therefore confined in its modern scope turned backward became retrospective and sought its outlet in the glories of that medieval world which had been so nearly akin in spirit to the modern sentiment it turned from recent atheistic tendencies to a mood of great devotion from lax morality to a high degree of upright conduct from the regard of liberty as the greatest good to that of responsibility to mankind as the goal 
only distantly and secondarily political this romantic movement was first of all moral and taught italians that in order to be good citizens they must be good men first as in all literary history the movement had a deep philosophic meaning and this sense of moral responsibility was the base of all manzoni's great creative efforts first of all then the literary movement which succeeded the revolutionary era in italy was idealistic as compared with the materialism of the days of the napoleonic occupation and secondly it was romantic in contradistinction to the classicism of the earlier times greek and roman themes for artistic expression were abandoned for the stories of national medievalism the papacy became the centre of its poetic aspiration and its spirit though highly ardent was far more truly modern than that of classicism had been our former critic de sanctis says that in this new movement religion is no longer a creed it is an artistic motive it is not enough that there are saints they must be beautiful the christian idea returns as art providence comes back to the world the miracle reappears in story hope and prayer revive the heart softens it opens itself to gentle influences manzoni reconstructs the ideal of the christian paradise and reconciles it with the modern spirit mythology goes the classic remains the eighteenth century is denied its ideas prevail manzoni stood first for that new movement which opposed morality to license in national development secondly for the temper which derided the classic limits of the three unities and held that a purely national event was as suitable for the purpose of artistic representation as the stories of classic history in addition to this he first adopted that form of romantic spirit which was rising so rapidly into use in england in the novels of walter scott in france in the writings of victor hugo and Lamennais, and in germany in those of goethe and schiller and gave italy the result in his great novel of italian life and history for each of these reasons manzoni represents a force potent in upbuilding italian character and strengthening it at the time of its great crisis though he drew suggestions from abroad he made his work italian and thoroughly italian if says de sanctis the romantic school by its name its ties its studies its impressions was allied to german traditions and french fashions it was at bottom italian in accent aspiration form and motive every one felt our hopes palpitating under the medieval robe the least allusion the remotest meanings were caught by the public which was in the closest accord with the writers the middle ages were no longer treated with historical and positive intention they became the garments of our ideals the transparent expression of our hopes alessandro manzoni was born in milan march seventh seventeen eighty five at about the time when alfieri was accomplishing his greatest work his father pietro manzoni belonged to the nobility and bore the title of count a title which alessandro when he inherited it at an early age refused to adopt and continued to refuse to use during his whole life his mother was the daughter of beccaria a man well known throughout europe for his studies of political economy and criminology and whose treatise entitled crimes and punishments was greatly admired in the voltairian circles of france alessandro's mother was a remarkably intelligent woman with a fineness of nature which was inherited by her son and which kept him unspoiled and simple through a life unusually acclaimed and applauded his earliest youth was spent among the hills of galbiate according to the custom of wealthy lombard families to send their children to the mountains in order to give them rugged health the boy was in care of a woman who was successively his nurse and governess and who taught him to read and stirred his interest in the legends and history of the neighbouring countryside when still a small boy he was sent to the church college of the frati lomaschi education being then entirely in charge of ecclesiastics he seems to have been in no wise an apt student 
the close confinement the strict discipline and the dry manner of teaching subjects which were all of an eminently classical nature combining to dull his spirits and interest stories are current in milan of manzoni's inability to learn almost bordering on stupidity but such stories are popular of men who have later shown great ability and deserve little credence suffice it that he showed no great aptitude for learning at the school of the frati Lomaschi, nor even later at the collegio dei nobili at the latter he did however meet the poet vincenzo monti a man well known throughout italy who had had for patrons the cardinals borghese and braschi a poet and dramatist whose pen was too apt to serve the political party in power but who had achieved wide popularity and whose poems were praised by critics as diverse-minded as byron and napoleon bonaparte monti met the young manzoni when he was on a visit to the college and took an interest in him alessandro admired the poet and it was perhaps this acquaintance which first actively interested him in literature as a pursuit the meeting of the boy walter scott with robert burns is a parallel in scottish literary annals in eighteen o five when he was twenty alessandro's father died and the youth left the collegio dei nobili and returned for a time to his mother after a period of home life he was sent to the university of pavia the best known of lombard universities his stay here was short his mother now a widow for several years was advised to go to france for her health and the close bonds which united mother and son would not allow of such a distant separation alessandro left the university and went with his mother to otoy which was then a fashionable watering-place where the beau monde of french art and letters gathered here and at paris he met the leading thinkers of the time volney cabany de tracy Fauriel, and condorcet all of whom were interested in the young man as the grandson of beccaria and because of his own originality of thought these men called themselves ideologues and claimed to have shaken off all the conventions of the previous centuries as a student manzoni had been an extremely liberal catholic and was usually considered by strict critics a follower of voltaire at paris and otoy however he met so many men of the then prevalent atheistic mode of thought that his own interest in his family religion was quickened and he emerged from his friendship with such men as cabany and condorcet a more pronounced churchman than he had been before it was characteristic of him to cling tenaciously to those precedents and standards which had so long survived in his own country his religion however was soon to become more to him than a field for philosophic speculation for in eighteen ten he married louise henriette blondel daughter of a banker of geneva who herself a convert from protestantism to the church of rome became most ardent in the church of her adoption she soon brought alessandro to her own enthusiastic view and from the date of his marriage his philosophy never varied Henriette manzoni possessed rare beauty and was long remembered in milan for her fresh blonde head and her blue eyes her lovely eyes and the young husband was ideally happy with his bride he had by now determined to try his skill at composition the three men whose fame was then at its height in italy alfieri vincenzo monti and ugo foscolo his bride had brought manzoni a country seat as well as considerable property and so he settled in the country and studied to perfect his style in writing his first works were a series of sacred hymns written directly under the influence of the renewed religious faith attendant on his marriage these were published in eighteen fifteen and were at once noticed as poems alike remarkable for deep religious feeling and great beauty of expression appearing as they did at a time when religion was being bitterly assailed churchmen looked upon the young poet as a distinct acquisition to their forces manzoni was not however even then a believer in the temporal power of the pope he said to madame collet the author of l'italie des italiennes i bow humbly to the pope and the church has no more respectful son but why confound the interests of earth and those of heaven the roman people are right in asking their freedom 
there are hours for nations as for governments in which they must occupy themselves not with what is convenient but with what is just let us lay hands boldly upon the temporal power but let us not touch the doctrine of the church the one is as distinct from the other as the immortal soul from the frail and mortal body to believe that the church is attacked in taking away its earthly possessions is a real heresy to every true christian this was the same view which manzoni held throughout his life and which stated in his quoted words gives the position taken by most enlightened men of the nationalist party in those later days when the question of the temporal power of the pope became vital for italy what the sacred hymn showed was that manzoni looked to the church as the centre of all true aspiration in religion rather than to philosophic theories as the safeguard of morals his next production carried him a step further in advance of his contemporaries and marked him as a leader of the romantic school in eighteen nineteen he wrote his first tragedy published the following year under the title il conte di carmagnola the subject matter was the career of carmagnola a celebrated condottiere of the middle ages and the dramatic form was entirely distinct from that classic construction which had so long tyrannized over the drama in an introduction he explains his departure from the classic unities of time place and action and gives his reasons for believing that the dramatist should be free to choose his own subject and to treat it in such fashion as shall seem to him best to express his idea the elizabethan dramatists had long before discarded the law of the unities in england and had carried their plots over such courses of time and place as they pleased and so had schiller in germany but in italy the law had been absolute from the time of tasso to that of alfieri eight years after manzoni's carmagnola appeared victor hugo brought on the great dramatic war in france with his cromwell and from the date of his ultimate triumph in paris dates the downfall of the classicists and the full glory of the romanticists in italy manzoni's step was violently attacked and defended conservatives opposed him but the younger element immediately acclaimed him as their leader the following year eighteen twenty one he wrote his great ode on the death of napoleon which had occurred on may fifth at st helena and the news of which had greatly affected all europe the ode entitled il cinque maggio was remarkable for great dignity a deep and profound estimate of napoleon's genius and a tribute to his colossal fame which even the french recognized as the fittest expression of poetic power the ode was at once translated into german by goethe and into english by gladstone and the earl of derby it immediately placed him at the head of the new school of continental poets very soon afterwards in eighteen twenty two manzoni wrote his second tragedy aldecchi a drama of the war between the lombards and charlemagne it followed the lines of the carmagnola repeating the break from classical precedents and establishing the value of the romantic school both dramas were acted but without success the carmagnola when it was given at florence in eighteen twenty eight had the open support of the court to offset the attacks of the old school and yet did not win even a mildly enthusiastic hearing the aldecchi was tried with a similar result at turin in spite of their ill reception on the stage both of manzoni's dramas were immensely popular with readers and although based on incidents remote in point of time both thrilled with a patriotism that stirred the hearts of all italians mr howell says of the tragedies in his modern italian poets the time of the carmagnola is the fifteenth century that of the aldecchi is the eighth century and however strongly marked are the characters and they are very strongly marked and differ widely from most persons of italian classic tragedy in this respect one feels that they are subordinate to the great contests of elements and principles for which the tragedy furnishes a scene in the carmagnola the pathos is chiefly in the feelings embodied by the magnificent chorus lamenting the slaughter of italians by italians at the battle of moclodio in the aldecchi 
we are conscious of no emotion so strong as that we experience when we hear the wail of the italian people to whom the overthrow of their longobard oppressors by the franks is but the signal of a new enslavement this chorus is almost as fine as the more famous one in the caramagnola both are incomparably finer than anything else in the tragedies and are much more dramatic than the dialogue it is in the emotion of a spectator belonging to our own time rather than in that of an actor of those past times that the poet shows his dramatic strength and whenever he speaks abstractly for country and humanity he moves us in a way that permits no doubt of his greatness manzoni's greatest work however was yet to appear for admirable as were his poems and inspiring as were his heroic dramas it was as a novelist that he was to reach his pinnacle of fame it was also as a novelist that he was to become one of the men who directly created that national spirit which made modern italy italy had had many poets but no great novelist since boccaccio fortunately manzoni had not been confined to the literature of his own land but had studied goethe shakespeare voltaire and scott and drew his inspiration largely from them he owed much to the english novel and especially to the author of waverley a man whom he much admired and who fully returned his admiration i promessi sposi appeared in eighteen twenty five and created a tremendous impression scott said that it was the greatest historical novel ever written and goethe said it satisfies us like perfectly ripe fruit it was the first and greatest italian romance and it awakened an interest throughout europe in italian history the scene is laid in milan under the harsh spanish rule of the seventeenth century and the reader is carried through the story of war and famine and the great plague its merits are hard to exaggerate the beauty of its descriptions and the accuracy of its history the intense interest of its characters a galaxy that embraces every walk of life the truth of its philosophy are equally remarkable the universal feelings of humanity pulse through its pages as dr garnett says of it as a picture of human nature the book is above criticism it is just the fact neither more nor less victor hugo in les miserables wrote a book which appealed to the innate democracy of man but manzoni in i promessi sposi made the same appeal without having recourse to the frenchman's use of the grotesque and gigantic through the whole of the latter novel runs the note of a profound sympathy with the poor and the unfortunate a note which is perhaps stronger in this book than in any romance ever written it is the work of a great mind fully alive to every sensibility and sympathy accurate in its judgments and to which in the ancient words nothing human is foreign cardinal and priest brigand and simple hero grand dame and the lovely girl whose hand promised in marriage gives part title to the book are each perfect in their way and bring the characteristics of a past century vividly before the present goethe pointed out the too great prominence of the historical element but the very careful attention paid by manzoni to the accuracy of his setting must add to the sense of reality which he so completely gains the novel was rapidly translated into all modern languages and at once created a school of historical novelists in italy to us who have seen the romantic movement give place in turn to that of realism it is difficult to understand what scott and hugo goethe and manzoni did for the men of the first quarter of the nineteenth century they made people feel as they had not felt before the wide scope of existence and the importance of the individual literature had been a matter of form and convention of classic model of purely aristocratic vision the new movement was part of that same impulse which was demanding constitutions of kings and bringing the middle classes into political prominence it was an awakening of public spirit which had slept soundly through several centuries voltaire and rousseau alfieri and foscolo had sounded the first notes of a new intellectual renaissance and now hugo and manzoni went further and stepped boldly out from all classic restraints 
although i promessi sposi is more widely known and more highly regarded than any italian book except the divine comedy of dante manzoni's personality impressed itself but little upon his age he had not the fighting nature of victor hugo nor the mental unrest of byron two of his great contemporaries he preferred the retirement of his farm to the excitements of milan and although he was always an ardent advocate of italian unity and freedom he took but small part in the great events that soon delivered lombardy from austria after the appearance of i promessi sposi he wrote little more formerly he said the muse came after me now i should have to go after her his quiet life laid him open to the charge of an indifferent patriotism but those who knew him best understood that such an accusation was bitterly untrue when the austrian government returned to milan the members of the lombard nobility were required to write their names in an official register or forfeit their titles manzoni preferred to lose his claim as a patrician and later refused a decoration saying that he had made a vow never to wear any order of knighthood he afterwards offered the same excuse to victor emmanuel when the latter wished to decorate him he was elected a senator in eighteen sixty when the first national assembly met and went to turin to take his seat but soon after retired to the privacy of his own home on lake maggiore here he entertained many great guests among them cavour and d'azeglio to whom he was warmly attached his life flowed on an even current the existence of a philosophic spirit interested as an observer rather than as an actor henriette manzoni died in eighteen thirty three and in eighteen thirty seven he married teresa bori widow of count stampa he saw his children grow up about him and go to take their places in the world gradually he saw the cause of national freedom win its way and the king to whom he was so devoted unite the scattered states under one crown he saw the fall of the temporal power of the pope and with it the consummation of his hopes in eighteen seventy three at the age of eighty eight he died universally mourned and revered a milanese journal said after the confessor left the room manzoni called his friends and said to them when i am dead do what i did every day pray for italy pray for the king and his family so good to me his country was the last thought of this great man dying as in his whole long life it had been his most vivid and constant affection it was nearly fifty years since his last important work had appeared but during that long half-century of inactivity manzoni's fame had grown steadily his romance had passed through one hundred and eighteen editions in italian alone milan decreed him a state funeral and representatives of all european countries appeared at the old lombard capital with addresses from their sovereigns it has been said that manzoni's death evoked a greater unanimity of sentiment than has been called forth by that of any other great author of modern times except possibly by that of sir walter scott even those who had criticised manzoni had always spoken their opinions in a spirit of reverence he was regarded as the great guiding figure in the course of the new national literature a singularly uneventful life for one of the great builders of a nation uneventful even for that of a scholar or poet moreover the role of his works is small numerically comprising his sacred hymns the two dramas the ode on napoleon the single novel and in addition only a few essays the innominata or column of infamy an historical note to i promessi sposi an essay on the romantic school called letters on romanticism and one entitled letters on the unity of time and place the purpose of which was to show that the unity of action is the only unity of importance to the dramatist the bulk of his work was not great but each expression of it was masterful in its way the hymns true poetry as well as deep religious sentiment the ode considered the finest ode in all italian poetry the dramas pulsing with life and feeling the novel unsurpassed 
these were the literary values of his work but these in themselves would not account for manzoni's influence on his times he was a moral and political force showing the men of his day that nations can only hope for liberty and peace when the citizens respect the law and virtue a generation that had lived through the french revolution and the napoleonic era needed someone to lead them back to moral sanity and this was the greatest of manzoni's works like gioberti like d'azeglio like victor emmanuel manzoni was a staunch catholic as well as a true italian a close friend signor bonghi said of him he had two faiths one in the future of catholicism another in the future of italy and the one whatever was said whatever happened never disturbed the other in anxious moments when the harmony between the two was least visible he expected it the most and never allowed his faith in one or the other to be shaken rome he wished to be the abode of the king rome he wished also to be the abode of the pope obedient to the divine authority of the pontificate no one passed a more correct judgment upon its civil character or defended with more firmness when speaking upon the subject the right of the state that he was the poet of resignation as monnier declared is disproved by his dramas and his novel the martial lyrics of the plays burn with a spirit only too evidently fired by the contemporary subjection of italy to austria and france take for example the first and last verses of one of the lyrics in the aldecchi as rendered into english by miss ellen clark from moss-covered ruin of edifice nameless from forests from furnaces idle and flameless from furrows bedewed with the sweat of the slave a people dispersed doth arouse and awaken with senses all straining and pulses all shaken at a sound of strange clamour that swells like a wave in visages pallid and eyes dim and shrouded as blinks the pale sun through a welkin beclouded the might of their fathers a moment is seen in eye and in countenance doubtfully blending the shame of the present seems dumbly contending with pride in the thought of a past that hath been and deem ye poor fools that the need and the guerdon that lured from afar were to lighten your burden your wrongs to abolish your fate to reverse go back to the wrecks of your palaces stately to the forges whose glow ye extinguished so lately to the field ye have tilled in the sweat of your curse the victor and vanquish in amity knitted have doubled the yoke to your shoulders refitted one tyrant had quelled you and now ye have twain they cast forth the lot for the serf and the cattle they thrown on the sods that yet bleed from their battle and the soil and the hind are their servants again could manzoni have meant such words to speak other than of the austrians and bourbons who were grinding italians into servitude could his marvellous metre which has been said in its plunging to suggest a charge of horses have been meant other than to drive his countrymen to self-assertion manzoni was patriot as well as artist and read his times with no unskilful eye when victor emmanuel visited milan in eighteen fifty nine he said that he should like to meet the poet and when told that the latter was ill declared that he would go to him manzoni however would not hear of this and as soon as he was able called upon the king the sovereign's marks of regard and respect overwhelmed the poet later he said of the meeting i see in the character of the king the intervention of providence he is exactly the sovereign that circumstances require to accomplish the resurrection of italy he has rectitude courage incorruptible honesty and disinterestedness he seeks not glory or fortune for himself but for his country he is so simple never caring to appear great and he does not meet the admiration of those who seek to find in princes and heroes theatrical actions and grandiloquent words he is natural because he is true and this makes his enemies say that he is wanting in regal majesty 
to found italian unity he has risked his throne and his life manzoni's prophecies came true and he himself had no small part in accomplishing that great end towards which so many men of diverse forces worked as well as king and statesman warrior and prophet the man of letters taught his people how to find their independence end of section three